Okay, good evening. Um, thank you for coming out tonight um, uh, to the happy hour gallery talk with Too Smart City. David Jimison, Julian Paik, and Daniel Bowens are here with us tonight to give us a context for their project, which is on display down in the gallery. Um, I'm going to be very brief um, and just hand it over to, to them this evening. Um, but you know, I do just want to make a couple of announcements in terms of acknowledgments. Um, you know, clearly, um, you know, I want to sort of acknowledge the support for uh, this project by the Architectural League of New York through thick and thin. They've stuck with uh, us, uh, myself, the curator, and obviously the, the five teams that have uh, been um, working so hard for the last year to uh, produce these amazing projects we have down in the gallery. Uh, in particular, I'd like to uh, thank Greg Westner, who uh, seems to be uh, still at the bar downstairs. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, Greg is the project director of uh, the, the show, the exhibitions director for the Architectural League, um, as well, uh, obviously, Rosalie Ginevro, the executive director of the League. Uh, the staff here, we've got Reed manning the camera. Uh, Sarah is walking around somewhere as well. Um, uh, Varric sitting here right by the door um, they have an incredibly dedicated staff which has made my role as the curator of the exhibit very easy and um, I'd have to say you know, very much thank you for that um, we also need to acknowledge the uh, J. Clawford Mills Fund which uh, has uh, made possible uh, these five commissions uh, these commissions were selected out of over 150 entries uh, from uh, four different continents and so we have an incredible, rig incredibly rigorous process which uh, produced uh, what we think are five uh, exceptional projects. Um, in addition, uh, the exhibition downstairs in the gallery is supported by the Graham Foundation for the Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts. And uh, the website uh, at sentientcity.net has been supported by the U University of Buffalo's Department of Architecture and Department of Media Study. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to David and Julian. Thanks. So um, we're Too Smart City, it's a project we built, and today uh, what we're going to be talking about is what our process was like in trying to build everyday furniture for a, a future scenario, a sentient, sentient city. And some of the things we're going to cover are our artistic intentions when we enter this process, um, how we examine the everyday and how we try to create a trajectory of the everyday into the future, and what it means to try to design and invent futuristic objects that are designed to fail every time. So uh, before we go to showing the process of the project, we are gonna just show what actually, historically what Dave and I was interested in, in uh, looking, at a few, looking at a few of our body of works. So, Um, so, personally, I, I live in New York City. I'm born in from uh, I'm born in Korea, and um, what I make is usually objects that you can use in everyday life, but they're a little twisted and uh, recycled through the um, from the original objects. So, what you see here in the pillow wig is just from normal pillow wig and taking the behavior of people sleeping in public space, so that the object itself is guiding or engaging with the behavior that you will, you will do in everyday life and also include, um, have some humor to it. Um, this is a recent work showing, um, this is called Not Bicycle Cover. It's actually a bicycle cover that's, um, uh, that's camouflaging the bike as a trash pile of trash. So again, this is also inspired by the scene of the New York City uh, looking at the bike robbery problem and the um, the trash piles piling up every day. So 
that's also uh, related to the everyday object engaging the fun and humor to it. So Jiyun and I met as artists at iBeam Art and Technology Center in New York. And at the time, I was working on BoozeBot with another artist. And BoozeBot is, like the name implies, a robotic bartender. What I was interested at the time with that was not so much robotics as the myth of the bartender that has conversations, sort of the old-timer bartender that, that cares about you. And so I built a robot around that that that's focuses on social banter and uh, playfulness. In, in addition, a lot of my uh, work are environmental uh, envi environments, immersive environments, uh, where the guest participation is highly scripted. Uh, this one here was a, an event called Underground, held at iBeam, that I directed, and it was a 5,000 square foot maze with in, uh, actors and classically trained dancers and musicians and artworks that were um, engaged as you, as you went through this space. Is that you on the ground? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Thanks. Um, uh, as well, I've been finishing my dissertation as a PhD at Georgia Tech's digital media program. While I was residing in Georgia, I spent three years uh, leading a group called the Mobile Technologies Group, and that's focused on what are the cultural applications of mobile and pervasive technologies. On this screen is uh, Wiggle Stick. It's an urban navigation system for pedestrians. Uh, this is pre-iPhone, so if you look at the graphics, I just want to say that. <laughs> but the, the idea behind Wiggle Stick was really using the, the vibration sensors of a phone to provide hot, cold directions. So you could just put your phone in your pocket and still be guided through a city. Um, and also thinking about, about technology from a pedestrian's situation. So um, before we even begin the project or think about project idea, what we really did was just walk around the city. Just Dave and I will take a, a day off and just wander around, uh, carry a camera and video camera, and just keep documenting and documenting, observing people's normal behavior. And um, that's how we basically studied. And, um, so to sort of paraphrase here, I think that um, everyday life, we're, we're, the way when we use the term, we're really talking about the acts, the rituals that people do on a daily basis. And uh, they're, they're the, a very, it's a very sort of particular form of uh, urban study. So, um, well, every day is interesting to us because we often do not notice. Like here, it's just, I think those are for the uh, fire hose that you connect, but I mean, we know that object is a functional thing, but if you actually look at the form of it, it's kind of organic and mysterious as well too. And also, um, they are also, uh, has a high impact on our lifestyle. So as you look at those, a lot of pedestrian signs guiding you to where to go when there's uh, construction, um, scenes behind, those are, those are always like um, misrecognized, but those are the rules and systems that we are, have to follow in the city. So we began thinking about this project when we were writing our um, proposal with this idea of wandering through and really investigating some of the comical elements that we take for granted as every day. But this is about the sentient city, and um, we look at what the everyday is, it's a, it's a fluctuating situation. The everyday of 20, 80 years ago is different than the current one. And as we move towards um, the future, and I'm sorry, we seem to have an image problem here. This is a great archigram shot here of a future city. As we move to uh, what the futuristic city is, I think we need to try to imagine what are those rituals, what are those actions that people are going to be doing in, in the sentient city. And then we ran into an interesting problem because we don't want this to be future tech. We don't want this to be so novel that people would look at the objects and just enjoy them as a sort of science fiction. Instead, we had to signify that these are supposed to be every day. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about in, in, in the talk tonight is really how can you signify something that is both every day and also raises a conversation about what the future every day might be. So... Um... Objects. There's many objects in the city, right? Um, after we observing people, we start to observe objects that actually 
um, guides how people should behave or it introduce the style of, of the everyday. And we stumble upon to these three objects, which is bench, trash can, and sign. And we chose to actually um, alter these three objects and create a scene of future city. The reason behind is that they are, we realize they're most ubiquitous and not only ubiquitous, but also most um, engaging with our normal behavior. It's most interactive. If you think about trash can, it's everywhere, but also pro it's probably the one of the objects we mostly use in the, especially in New York City, as well as bench, because New York City is also a very uh, walking city uh, where there's a lot of pedestrians, and so everybody wants to see it. And also the sign, there's a lot of rules within the city that guides you to do things. So each of these objects, in a way, reflects an, an urban system, in our, in our opinion. And some of the thoughts we had about them, looking at them, were that everywhere we went, people were trying to sit down. They're trying to lean against the pole to relax. And so a bench isn't simply the point to relax. It's actually a place that's condoned to sit. It's been chosen, selected. It has a specific view, has a specific environment that's been designed to sit. And so because of that, there's a lot of policy. There's a lot of very interesting factors that go into place with our everyday benches. Similarly, the trash can... Um, what we loved about the trash can, we're actually recycling trash cans because we started to think about them as this micro labor that forgives consumption, where I'm going to do a little bit of sorting and then I'll forget whether it's a can, you know, or if I say it's a can, I put it and I sort it, then, then, I, then I'm free. It's okay that, I, that I, I bought that extra Coke because I have recycled it. Um, and then signs, of course, are the voice of authority. They're, they're objects that, that are, are very much based about the politics of the vicinity. And so we were thinking about, well, what does that mean when, when authority can be dynamic, when it can shift to reflect the real-time, everyday, sentient city? So we chose the three objects, but then we also decided to put, it, put them together because there, we... It's also not necessarily about object itself. It's about the experience of when audience or public comes in and engage with that future scene. Um, so, and we decided to take a scenario of being in a park, whereas bench, trash can, signs are always in park. And for especially for the sign, we decided there's a lot of different signs in the city, but we decided to have uh, park rules on the sign and. Um, rotate through uh, different projection and show uh, there's a lot of information overload and stuff. So for design, we started, our design process was actually designing something that's that not to design anything. So basically, we, we although we thought about this future furniture, there's a lot of uh, sci-fi images that we imagine because of functionality or because of fashion or, or because of the trend or style, it will look different. But our goal was to actually audience to recognize bench should recognize it as normal as a bench in the beginning, so they'll have uncanny experience or same as trash can and sign. So what we started to do was measuring all these uh, public furniture in the city in different angles, uh, looking at the materials looking at how, what screw they use, um, how they're assembled. So processing all those, all those information actually got into our final design, which looked like just normal furniture, <laughs> but, but, but my function. <laughs> I, can I interject here also? Yeah. I also wanted to bring, uh, bring up that uh, once you start thinking about how a bench is made, you start, you start actually seeing all the benches that there are everywhere and like noticing them and be like, Oh, there's this design bench and there's this design bench. Wow, there's a lot of benches here. I've never seen all these benches before. Yeah. <laughs> I think you had the same comment about yeah. that. Like you start to analyze them and try to see how they're made. Yeah, and there's also sort of signifiers of different design or different cultures that happen. You know, this and we one of the things we thought of is well, if if this show is over and we want to take it to, for instance, Korea or something, is this too much of a New York City design to be able to travel around? So we needed to have this very mundane, adaptable design for it. But right now, um, I'm going to show you some of the early scratches we did, thinking about how these things can fail. And I'm going to talk about how our attempts at failure would have failed. So, 
You'll see that uh, we have the trash can, <laughs> the bench. Um, there's no sign here, um, but anyways, the point is that we were, we were we spent a lot of time really thinking, okay, we want these things to be on an existing space. We want people to use them a lot, and we want them to be able to break in a way that's intended. So um, this one I love because <laughs> it's kind of a uh, torture museum style where these these uh, you're you're prodded I guess off of the bench a little bit, um, and that got passed by this one. But in this scenario, it, it was a pinch point. So we were worried, okay, people might get pinched. Uh, and this up here, it was a a folding system. Uh, there's a good vocabulary word I can't remember for that, but um, sort of an accordion system on it. Uh, but of course, again, once we got really excited about it, we started to think, wait, people are going to be sitting there, it's going to collapse, it's going to be a lot of pain. Um, <laughs> and then this one, we loved for the comic value of the entire trash can inflating and discarding everything in every direction. But what you, what you find out when you put a trash can in public space is that people put all kinds of trash in it. And if people put broken glass in that, those are kind of our rule with trash can. It's, what would it do with broken glass? And obviously, this one would have done well. <laughs> so our really effort was to well, we we our effort was to make things really break. And the first step um, after thinking about design was the um, testing, like because it's the furniture itself is not for to look, but it's to engage people. So we did a. Uh, cardboard wizard of, wizard of testing and it's basically you sit behind, you make really like, it, it takes like, this is a uh, empty, it's, it's a trash can model, it takes like five minutes to make and it's basically a person behind sitting in it and actually acting the scenario that it's supposed to do which is throwing back the trash at you once audience throws it at you. So, um, and then we analyzed the behavior and we had a lot of actually added functionality like trash can maybe you should talk after you throw in it, you should say thank you, this, or we will announce this is a smart trash can. We had a lot of it scenario, but we really nailed, we were able to really nail down to the final version that we have now through actually this process. Um, and so the, the, big, the big save here, right, is that we are able to test out certain ideas, certain designs, without having to build a huge robot. Um, and this is very critical when you're, when you're trying to think of something that nobody's ever experienced, but you want them to intrinsically know how to use it. Um, and so, so in, this, in this prototype, obviously, ji behind the trash can and acting as the machine, and we recruited 20 people to say, and we said, don't, never mind the woman behind the screen, just, <laughs> just pretend that this is a city trash can and you throw the object away. And after that, we videotaped these long conversations where we'd extol all the virtues and problems with our design. I want to point out, from this specific prototype, you'll notice our trash can had a lid, because we thought, well, that'll be directional. And what happened is people would throw the trash away, and it would come right back at them. And they would just land on them, and so we thought, okay, we have to change the design now so that it goes up and people see it coming, rather than it's shooting at their waist level. Um, and now we're going to show you a video of the next stage, and then we'll talk a bit about what you're watching. So this is uh, the first prototype of the bench. It was uh, roughly made with wood plywood. And basically, I'm testing how, mu how much angle it should be lifted to, for people to feel urged to stand up and get out of bench, and also the speed of the bench as well and the height, like the girl is looking, uh, measuring it. One of the things I've loved about uh, blog responses or people that make comments about the benches, there's this scenario everyone has, I guess it's culturally intrinsic, of the grandma scenario. And they hear about a bench and they say, what if my grandma sat on it? She'd just fall off and get hurt and then I'd have to sue you, which is something we'd actually thought of quite a bit. So when you think about the motors and the design, it again is really thinking, how can we make this bench that's going to fail, that's going to kick people off, but in the most polite, yet, safe, safe, yeah. safe fashion. <laughs> um, and so that gets to our next part, which is um, in this field of technological art, how do you, how do you build things and how do, you, how do you think about designing in a way? And that's sort of our next portion, just how do you design in a way that's going to that's gonna get your content 
and your, your, your story across, and of course work. There's hundreds of ways to build robots. Uh, and for when you finally decide on one, there's, there's you know, hundreds of manufacturers for, in, for each. Just to sort of talk you through what you're looking at here, this is the sonar sensor that appears at the type, top of the sign and uh, detects when people are nearby or how far away objects are. Uh, above here is, is one of my favorite. It's a, a photoresistor or a light sensor. It detects how much light is there. We have 16 of these embedded into the seats of our bench. And uh, I call it the ASS algorithm. It basically <laughs> determines what shape is blocking the light. My mom's cringing. So. <laughs> um, it determines what shape is, is blocking the light and if it's a butt or two butts and how long they've been sitting there for and if it should kick them off. And then finally here, um, this, is, this is something that I think tech art has to deal with a lot is uh, this is a $50 toy metal detector. And when you're looking at sensors a lot, talking to companies about it, they all prescribe these $1,000 ones that were very high value. And we ended up getting a $50 one, cutting it apart and hacking it. And um, it works pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So. Where did you use that one? Well, uh, that's for the trash can to determine where it, it basically, complete with a laser to tell us where something's in there. Yeah, so we're missing that image, too. So. Um, Dave, you, uh, Daniel, can show us. Yeah. yeah, we, um, yeah, we we're in the older version of the, of yeah. the slideshow, but it's fine. I'll just point this out real quick. So the thing we're missing right here, I'm not sure if you can see this, but it's an older version of the bench, the sketch. And what you'll notice is that there's a middle leg here attached to an actuator. When the actuator pushes forward, the L-shaped leg lifts the seat up. This is great because you have one actuator that can lift the seat up, rather than two that can move at different lengths and break. But the problem is, no benches have a middle leg. So one of the things we had to do was decide form or function. And we decided on, on form over function, where we said, OK, you know what? It's most important to us that this looks like an everyday object. So we're going to go for the, the system that can afford that kind of aesthetic. Okay, I'm gonna pass the mic to Daniel. I didn't change the slides, so I'm gonna have them. This is at least several slides the same place. You wanna to try to open it again? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry, we'll try to open it again, see if we can pull out those pictures. This one. Oh. Yeah. Wish I knew a good joke right now. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> hey, does okay. anyone wanna see that? Uh, let me see. Yeah, let's go to that art gram shot. Yeah, yeah let's go to see. Uh, go up. Here, just get this. This shot, or the or the architecture. This is fine. This is fine. Okay. Okay. So, this show. Um, well, I see. I'm. My name is Daniel Bowen. I'm a um, mechanical engineer. Um, I often work with artists on art projects, uh, doing consulting, um, uh, design analysis, making sure things won't kill people. Hopefully, you know, like with the. <laughs> Especially sometimes I work with like structures that are, like seventy feet tall, big steel things, big steel sculptures, and uh, you have to really do a lot of uh, analysis in the background that many people don't necessarily have an appreciation for to ensure that nothing's going to go wrong and when it's being used, when people are playing with it, some of these things move, and um, so so that's that's what I do and. Um, I kind of I came in on this project after pretty much after all this uh, uh, everything they've ta they've talked about so far, and um, I have to say that they 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 consider themselves artists, but they are also quite good at building things, as you saw by the the prototype bench, and um, they're just good enough to be dangerous, and <laughs> because uh, they. Um, I, I often got calls from uh, from David saying, "Oh no, we um, we broke something on the on this bench. What do I do to fix it?" And, and I would have to find a quick solution um, to 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 resolve to resolve that problem. Um, so so they also they also cross over into engi the engineering world, even though they even though they're also they're also artists. 
Um, I'm kind of the other way. Where I'm, I'm mainly an engineer, and I, cr I cross over into the art world in, in, in as far as helping designs and stuff like that, but I often don't do the initial design of what it looks like. Um, so here we have a, on, the, on the right side, we've got, we got a CAD model, and this was, this was designed by um, some engineers here locally for, the, for both the, the bench and there, there would be a similar model for the, the sign. And on the, on the, the left side, this is, this is kind of our, our paper sketches of throwing, th this is how we interacted, it was, uh, in the beginning, was just throwing back and sketches back and forth each other. What if, what if, we, can, what if we do this, what if we do this? Mm -hmm. And this is, this is kind of a higher level from the initial concepts were, which were, how is this bench gonna move? You know, now it's like, how do we make it move? And here you see we have like a, oops, oops. I don't know how many slides, I need to talk about them. <laughs> Um, we have like a, we have a linear actuator under the bench with an arm lifting it up, and there's a there's a there's a parallelogram linkage. It keeps everything it keeps the back straight. So there's a lot of things to consider of like preventing pinch points, um, keeping the back straight. How's the motion? How's the motion going to work? And how the motors are going to drive it? And then you have the you have the controllers that control the motors and the electronics, which Dave Dave did a lot. Dave did most of. Um, Dave did all the, all the electronics. Uh, I don't want to take any claim on that. <laughs> um, I, uh, the, other than the initial consulting on the, on, the, on the sign and the bench, I worked on the, the trash can uh, very closely and um, built, built all the mechanical parts of the trash can. And the trash can, um, seemingly a simple device that just blows out some trash or, or, or accepts a can actually has a lot of complexity behind it. And these are, these are showing some of the sketches that we made up beforehand to, to um, kind of figure out like which way we wanted the trash can to work. How, did, how, did, how was it going to function? Which way would prevent pinch points? Which way would be the easiest? Which um, There's many things to consider when you're designing this. And on the right, we have the, the final design with, uh, the simplified version of the final design, which uses a fan to blow out any trash that's not acceptable as it can. Um, even in this, we had to consider the angle of the trash coming out because if the, ang if the trash came straight up, it would often just fall right back into the trash can and then it would shoot back up and fall right back into the trash can. It was like a cyclical, ended up being a cyclical effect. So we actually had to angle it so it would get that arc coming out and end up outside the trash can. Um, here, here are a few more, a few more sketches that we threw back and forth to each other uh, about the bench. Um, this was this was before before the final design, and these do, these are these all of these these concepts led to the final design. This is this is actually different. These drive mechanisms are different. Um, the next slide shows a video of. This is using um, CAD, CAD software to, to do an, a quick analysis of how that angle would work. Um, Did you see the fan? It moved initially, didn't it? Yeah. Let's go back up here. Um, okay. No, not playing. Uh-oh. Hmm. We can show it later. Actually. Yeah. Okay. So this just shows the bench tilting up, and so using 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 CAD, we can analyze. I can change the linkages very quickly. We do a quicker analysis than we can with the wood prototype. You know, we can quickly see how how far it would dump someone off, or if it would have pinch points, and and um, what what the maximum angle is we need, where the actuator needs to be. So that allows. The, the, the software allows us to, to go through these iterations faster and then throw the, throw the ideas back and forth to each other. Um, I think this is about it on my, on my side. So, Thank you, Daniel. Okay. Yeah, we were really lucky to have him for any consulting problems. So um, that was the story about building the object. But actually, our in, like ultimate goal was to bring this object in the right space to have the right context, which is real park. 
Um, but then there was a lot of problem uh, arise, which is first about safety for public when there's no one looking at the furniture and what if somebody cut off their finger into something. I mean, we obviously consider a lot of those uh, when we were in design phase and we are confident, but also it's to have the bulletproof, we needed a lot of more um, testing over time. And it's the, but the most difficult part was actually permit to get the permission from the city, uh, from the park department. And just uh, one of the things that we became kind of aware of, I, I just hadn't been aware of, was when we were talking to people about, the, getting, talk about implanting the city or mm -hmm. talking to people, um, getting advice on that, we said, well, find past work that's done this. And you start to think, well, there's not too many autonomous moving objects in the city because that's dangerous, and maybe there's a good reason for that. And, um, and just, so I, I think that at the end of the day, I think we're really, really happy to be in a gallery space where the pieces are respected more and they're, they're kind of watched more um, because we're trying to propose something about the everyday life in the future, but we're not really replicating what that would be. Yeah. So here are our three, three pieces in, uh, in their form in the gallery. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about, about them in case somebody here hasn't seen them in action. So here's the trash can. Um, and while we're looking at this, there was, when we thought about how this is gonna be in public space and how people were gonna engage with it, one of the things we really were anticipating was this uncanniness and this fun. It's an everyday object with particular codes and expectations. So when you have a trash can, you expect that when you put trash in, it stays there. And for it to do the opposite and to throw it back at you is, um, is, is uncanny and it's surprising. Uh, perhaps it's a little challenging, but of course it's fun too. It's, it's, a playful, it's a playful thing. And you'll see this where people throw the object in, throw it back in, and, and, and have, a, have a really a fun time with the animated devices. This is our, our bench. These are people being evicted from the bench. <laughs> Um, and one of the great things, actually, is that all these images and videos we'll be showing you are, are from uh, people on Flickr or different yeah. sites uploading them and, and talking about it. Um, so the, the bench was, a, was another, was a, um, I think brings us to the point of, of you know, technical problems where you, you, this is bench, while well, we're trying to bring up this very serious issue of when do you allow people to rest or to, to recline on it, how long would that be, how does public policy engage in design, um, and how do we create this system that, that interacts with people? Well, our bench evicts people, lists it off, and we are so concerned with safety, um, we forgot that we made a really fun ride. And people would jump on and jump off and jump on and jump off. And that's, that's um, I mean, our, our bench right now is, um, is not working as well yeah. because, because... It's overused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was an interesting challenge for us to find a balance. Uh, between to actually convey the, our critical statement, a uh, critical idea about future city, to convey the statement, as well as having to have the engagement, you need to actually attract people. That's why we use uh, the fun and uncanniness. So it was interesting to balance those things, and obviously mm -hmm. it was gallery space. So we decided to make it more inviting, and it was just overused <laughs> for a time. Um, we can show you actually some of the video, how it worked. Hold on, how do you online post it online? Okay, so full screen. I was just gonna show it here. Hold on, let me pull it. Okay, so. This is the audience with the video. <laughs> and um, yeah, people sometimes lie down, people sit together and <laughs> I guess we'll take uh, questions. 